All right, well, we are on uh, week two here of a, just a three-week study of Proverbs 31, this God-fearing woman in Proverbs 31. And I've been asked a couple times uh, this last week, uh, why, why Proverbs 31? Why did you pick this, uh, this passage, this section? You know, it's usually in uh, more of a women's ministry context. And, uh, and the reason I picked it, the reason I wanted to go through it, is actually something we went through uh, with the, the students last semester and the reason I picked it for the students is because of just the importance of this issue. You, you're all aware, <coughs> excuse me, of the, just the world we're in, the, the battleground for uh, masculinity, femininity, the battleground for, for gender, for marriage, right? This is a, a battleground issue in the world that we're in. You get outside the, the walls of this room, the walls of this building, and you're confronted with a world that puts a, a different picture in front of women, uh, in front of young women, in front of moms, in front of older women, a different picture of, of fulfillment, a different picture of virtue. Uh, and so this is a battleground, not that we would uh, just be able to, to say the right theological things and have the right theological vocabulary, but this is a, a battleground for the hearts and minds of, of women in this room, the women in our homes, the women in this church, so that we would actually embrace, this is what God says uh, is biblical femininity. This is what God says he wants to produce in uh, the women in this church and the women who have been united to Christ. And part of this, uh, this battleground really is the, the question of, of purpose, of fulfillment. Right? Are, are, will, will we believe that God gets to decide what our purpose is, that God gets to decide what's going to be most fulfilling in life, or do we get to decide I mean, people have called, uh, called what our culture is going after the, the gospel of personal fulfillment. I don't know if you've heard that term, but gospel of personal fulfillment. That is to say that, that we get to decide what is most fulfilling. You know, as long as I get to do what I want to do, as long as I get to make my own rules, you know, the idea of you do you, treat yourself, you know, find your own purpose. As long as I get to do that, then I'll be fulfilled. Then I'll find joy and happiness, right? And that is at odds with the scripture, the scripture that says that God has decided, right? God has given us specific roles. God has given us a, a purpose. And we see in this passage, uh, God's will, you could say, for women. This is God's purpose. This is what pleases the Lord, this kind of virtue, uh, these kind of characteristics. So we get to put in front of ourselves, here's God's plan for the, the women in the church. This is God's plan for the, the daughters, for the young women, for the moms, this is what we get to collectively say. We want to go after together as a church to put in front of us. This is a picture of godliness. And uh, I was talking to, to someone this week just about, uh, just about teaching in general in the church, but a, a passage like this that, that puts forward all of these, uh, these virtues and characteristics. And the concern when you teach a passage like this is that I don't want to, to put another, as my friend called it, another brick in your backpack. You know, another brick in your backpack so that you walk away burdened saying, oh man, here's, a, here's another thing that I have to do. And you feel weighed down because you're saying, man, here's all the ways that I, that I can't achieve this. So the, the hope here is not to put a, a brick in your backpack, but actually to, to put in front of us as a church, you know, God's instruction for the women in the church as, a, as an encouragement, as a, as a picture for us to go after. You know, for us to all rally around and say, yes, that's what we're trying to, trying to go after. This is what God's spirit wants to produce in the women of this church. You know, think of just uh, God's instruction, a, a loving father who is taking us by the hand and saying, this is what I want for you. This is what I want to produce in your life. If you have the Holy Spirit, to have this picture of godliness and for, for God to say, this is what we're going after. And so just uh, to look at it that way as, a, as an encouragement, as, as a picture, a hopeful picture of this for the women in the church to say, this is what I want to go after. And if I have God's spirit, this is what God is empowering me to go after. And as you see a picture like this, there are going to be some, oftentimes, some ugly things we see in our own life, in our own hearts, right? Some obstacles, things that we have to confess to the Lord that are, that are obstacles to going after this picture of godliness. But, but again, the, the hope is that you would take these things as, as an encouragement to say, if I have God's spirit, I have his word, I have everything I need for godliness, that this would be, would be an encouragement to you, an encouragement to the church, you know, so that fathers could say, this is what I'm trying to raise my daughters toward. Husbands could say, this is what I'm trying to encourage my wife toward. Obviously, the women in the church would say, this is the, the, the character that I'm going after. 
And as we talked about uh, last week, just to remind us that really what the, the book of Proverbs is, how it gives us truth and principles through pictures, through word pictures, the, the picture book of the, of the Bible. So here it's going to give us some, some truism, some principles through pictures, through a, a picture of a life well lived, really a, a holistic life. You're looking at this, this woman who has lived a full life, and we're looking at snapshots of her life, really seasons of her life, kind of an overview What are the big events in her life? How did she live? How did she handle adversity? How did she work? How did she handle home life? So this is a a big picture snapshot of the the life of a virtuous woman through uh, through story, through uh, getting to see how she lived. So the the goal here is not that, that what I'm saying is that God is trying to produce in the women of this church that they would all sew their own clothes, uh, that they would all um, be able to plant a vineyard, uh, they would all get up at the same time, get up, get up and have candlelight, like it says here in, in this passage. But to, to go, what is the, the underlying virtue behind those things? What's driving those things? What are the, the characteristics in place? What's the, the godly character that's on display in this woman as she does all these things? And just to remind us here of the, the overarching character, what drives this woman? Look at Proverbs 31. Uh, again, this section, Proverbs 31, verses 10 through 31, at the end of the book of Proverbs. But the, what's driving this section, the, the very last, uh, second to last verse, Proverbs 31, 30. The characteristic of this woman, uh, above all other characters, is that she is a woman who fears the Lord. Verse 30, charm is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. So this is what's driving her. She is a God-fearer. She has a, a right relationship with the living God. This term, to fear the Lord, this is the Old Testament expression of saving faith. That you see God as, as judge, yes. You see God as holy, but you have actually submitted under him. You, you agree that he is judge. You, you agree that he is holy. You agree that you deserve justice. And yet you see him as a, as a loving father, as one who has actually atoned for sin through a substitute. Obviously, all of us in this room, in in the gospel, if you are in Christ, know uh, forgiveness. We fear God as his children. Uh, Fearing God is a a desire to please him. You know, a fear of offending, a fear of offending God at the same time, a desire to please God, uh, to see him as a a father who forgives, who loves, and, and a father who has a standard. This is what he wants to produce. So again, to look at this, this list as God's will, God's will for a woman. This is what God wants to produce, or to say this is what pleases God. These kind of virtues please the Lord. When it says this woman shall be praised at the end of verse 30, this is uh, just a sign that God is pleased with this kind of virtue. So just to remind ourselves again, to look down at the pages of Scripture and say this, this pleases God, this kind of character pleases God. To, to believe that in your heart to say yes and amen, this is the character that I want to go after. To plead with the Lord, humbly, Lord, produce this kind of character in me. And here, one of the the questions maybe that that gets asked as you look at this, is you say, man, this woman doesn't doesn't seem to sin. There's no sin on display. Everything seems to be, she just, she works hard, she's joyful, she serves. Does she ever do anything wrong? And I think under this banner of fear of the Lord, the the one who is a God-fearer is a repenter. Right? They are forsaking sin when they see it. They live with a clean conscience. So this is not a, a picture of perfection, right? but, a, but a picture of someone who is uh, taking short accounts with sin, who fears the Lord, so they forsake sin in their life when they see it. They turn from it. They confess it. And just to, to catch us up where we were at last week, last week we worked, we worked through the first uh, about 20 verses I just want to work through, uh, we'll spend uh, the rest of the time this morning working through the, the rest of the chapter as far as we get. And the next week, I just want to kind of zoom out and look at, here are the, the characteristics that we're talking about. Let's look at some of the, the virtues and just capture some of those uh, as kind of a big picture, just to, just to help us synthesize some of these truths. So that'll be next week. This week, we'll go through the, the rest of the chapter here. And uh, just to remind us, we looked at these, uh, these realms of faithfulness. Realms of faithfulness of this God-fearing woman really trying to, to capture uh, more of a thematic outline. Here's the, the themes of life. As you're looking at this, these pictures of her life, these snapshots, 
uh, to see what are, what are the realms, what are the areas of her life? How does she respond when she works? How does she respond to, to her resources, or really her responsibilities? How does she respond to others in relationships? Uh, we'll see t- today, how does she speak? How does she work in the home? All these different realms of her life and the faithfulness that's on display in her life. Uh, verses uh, 13 through 15 are, are her work we looked at. It says, She looks for wool and flax. She works with her hands in delight, like a merchant ship, bringing her food from afar, just this diligence, this labor to go all the way, to not, to not work halfway. She rises while it's still night, gives her food to her households and portion to her maidens. So uh, just a diligence uh, across the board, working hard to plan to give instruction to others, to delegate responsibilities, uh, to just to go all out in her work. Uh, verses 16 through 19, we looked at just her in, in regard to her resources. Really, her resources, you could say her, her responsibilities. You know, she is a, a steward of all the things that she's been entrusted. God has entrusted to her different, different resources, all of us in different positions. All of us have different uh, levels of finances, different gifts, different abilities, uh, different things that we own or don't own, but all of us have, have things to steward, our time to steward, our resources, you know, our skills, our abilities, uh, spiritual gifts given in the church to steward. And she is a, a steward of all of these things. She actually takes her resources and grows them for the benefit of her house. And then we'll look at uh, this morning, her relationships is where we left off last week. Her relationships, really how she interacts with others. We saw in verse 20, it says she extends her hand to the poor and she stretches out her hands to the needy. So this is her, as she is working, having her, her eyes up for those around her. She's considerate, she's generous, eager to give to others as they ask, as they have need. And then verse 21 is where we left off and it says, she is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. So here you have uh, this woman who has made clothes. Uh, she has given them, eagerly given to the poor, but she is, she is making clothes for the sake of her household and not just for the sake of today. She's actually preparing them for the future. You see that it says there in verse 21 that, that snow is coming, winter is coming. So she's actually preparing ahead of time for a, a future season. She knows, okay, there's, there's something I have to prepare my family for. I have to provide clothes for the, the winter that's coming. So she's working hard today to provide, and she's working hard for the future. There's a, just a prudence on display, a prudence in her household. You see, that's where the, the first audience, the primary audience here for her, the first benefit of her labor is her household in the home, and she prudently cares for her home. Uh, Proverbs talks about the, the prudent man, Proverbs twenty seven twelve, The prudent man sees evil and hides himself, but the naive rushes forward. Uh, to his own destruction. So the prudent one actually has the foresight to see evil coming. And evil just, just being, uh, even for this, in this passage, you know, something like winter. A hard season is coming. Difficult times are coming. There's something I have to prepare for. Whereas the naive, they just rush forward. They don't think about the future. They don't, they don't think about what's going on in their life. They don't assess what's going on around them. They just make choices and then rush forward. But she is prudent. She is thoughtful. She doesn't make decisions just on the fly. She's considerate, uh, looking around the next corner. Uh, Her head is not in the clouds. She's uh, aware of her surroundings. And again, focused on her household. She's aware of of those in her home. She's aware of what they need. She is planning for what they need. She's she's prudent for the sake of her family. And she uh, she had already gathered. We saw the verse uh, 13 all the way back up. She looked for wool and flax. She went out in the field, actually, to, to look for wool, flax uh, from a plant. Both of these needed for sowing. And then it says, uh, verse 19, she stretches out her hands to the distaff. In her hands grasp the spindle. Distaff is the, the sewing loom. So she is uh, working. She's gathering materials. She's sewing. And now she's making clothes for her family. So she has planned this well, well in advance. There is a, a thoughtful preparation in view here. You could say she is a, she's a prepper in the, in the right way. I don't know if any of you know uh, preppers or heard that term. People that are, are preparing. Uh, prepare. I see someone nodding back there. That maybe, they are, maybe they are a prepper. But uh, people that are preparing for, uh, you know, for if the power grid fails or for some, some kind of cataclysmic event. Right? So they, they prep. They have all this extra food, water, all this storage. 
I remember asking a guy uh, once just like to tell me the basics, a guy that was, was into this, tell me the basics of prepping. Like, what do I need to do? And he said, well, you have a pool, right? All right, well, you gotta, you gotta get a tarp to cover your pool because that'll help with the evaporation. So that'll give you a couple months of water. After that, you gotta plan. Where are you gonna go after those couple months? You know, what's your, what's your safe house? What's your getaway plan? And I, I made the mistake, don't do this. I made the mistake of asking him, well, where are you gonna go? And you don't, don't ask preppers that, right? They're, they're not gonna tell you. Uh, and then, it got, then it got awkward in the conversation. But, but you see the, the prepping here, you could do that out of fear. You could do that because you're scared of, every, of everything around the corner. You could you know, stockpile during COVID toilet paper and those things out of fear. But here she is prepping uh, for things that are actually known. You know, it's knowable that there is going to be snow coming. It's knowable that winter is coming, right? So she is taking the, the factors of her life. She's actually saying, what are the, the things that are knowable information? How do I prepare for, for what I can know? How do I help my family prepare for these things? You know, just to proactively think about what's going to benefit my house? What's going to benefit my kids? What do they need in this season? What do they need in the next season? So there's a, just an assessment. And just think about in a family, just the, the safety here especially parenting for kids, to have this kind of a loving preparation, not half-cocked decisions, but just a, a, thoughtful, a thoughtful care, preparing for their needs. You know, there's a, a safety there, a, a stability there for them. And this is what she provides in the home. And then we get to, <clears throat> to verse 22. After she has uh, made clothing for her household, it says she makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. And maybe you read that and you think, well, finally, she gets to, to indulge a little bit. Finally, she gets to make clothes for herself. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's exactly what's in view. I mean, she's clearly making clothes for herself. I don't think this is uh, self-indulgent. You know, I think that, that what's in view is just the progression of she has been eager to give to others. Uh, in verse 20, she has made clothes for her own household. And then, and then she makes clothes for herself. She has necessary clothes that she needs. And she has done that after she has had everyone else taken care of, right? She's not taking her paycheck, running and spending it all on herself. She is caring for the needs of others around her and then caring for her own needs. And what, what is actually shocking in this verse is you see the, her clothing is fine linen and purple. That is the, the clothing of nobility, uh, royal clothes. So we actually find out that this is uh, someone of noble class, a uh, high standing in society. And if you've read up to this point, uh, that, that wouldn't be obvious to you. you know, maybe you'd see that she has a vineyard, that she plants fields. So you'd see that, okay, she has resources. But the way that she works, the way that she works with her own hands, that it doesn't seem like the, the work of nobility, right? It seems like the work of a servant. She's out there in the field. She's out doing the hard labor. And I think this should shock us, you know, in our culture that says, man, I want to have more resources so that I can take a break. I want to retire so that I can stop working. I want to, I want to, I'm going to have more money so I can have more conveniences to just relax a little bit more. Well, she has resources. She is uh, in a noble position, and she works this hard. She works with her hands. She labors diligently. She isn't taking a break because she has resources. And she's not using them to her, for herself. You know, she's able to enjoy the good things God's given. I think it's helpful to look at this verse and say she's, she's enjoying the fruit of her hand. She's able to make herself fine clothes. She's able to enjoy the good things God has given as a, an overflow, but that's not what she's living for. That's not what she's going after. And I think this, this verse is also helpful just to think about just modesty. Uh, modesty, just the, what, you know, the clothing that she wears. You could say she wears clothing that's, that's proper or fitting for her station in life. Respectable clothing. You know, there's not a, an extra virtue in, in looking shabby. You know, sometimes we, we kind of go to two extremes. You know, to say we're, it's, it's virtuous, virtuous to, to never look nice, to be unkept, or obviously the other extreme, to, to be so consumed with how you look, to be self-indulgent. And I think this, this verse, uh, if you turn to First Peter, just helpful to think about just the, the virtuous woman in regards to how she thinks about just even her appearance. Turn to, to First Peter. This passage in First Peter we'll look at a couple times this morning. First Peter 3 you keep your hand in Proverbs 31. First Peter 3, uh, verse 3 and 4 is a, just a helpful passage, I think, to, to look at as you look at Proverbs 31 here. 
uh, it talks about the, the adornment, the clothing. He's talking to women here. He says, your ador- adornment, which you wear, must not be merely external, braiding the hair, wearing gold jewel- jewelry, or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. And there in that verse, you see the, the primary focus is on her inner character. But Peter's not saying, don't wear, you're not allowed to wear uh, jewelry, you're not allowed to put on dresses. But he's saying, don't let that be your focus. Don't let your focus be on how you look. Don't be self-indulgent, you could say, in how you look. You know, focus a lot more on your character. Verse 4, the, the hidden person of the heart, internal character, let that be your focus more than your external appearance. Because what does the Lord look at? The Lord looks at the heart. So cultivate a, a pure inner life rather than going after externals. This will go back to Proverbs 31, but helpful just to hold those things that, together, that she is wearing uh, linen, fine clothes, and to hold that with 1 Peter 3 to say, but to not be self-indulgent, to not live for those things, to not, to not have an inordinate desire for those things, just to consider you know, what you wear and why you wear it. What are you going after? So here you have just this balance for this woman. Uh, she is dignified. She, she dresses in a way that's uh, fitting to her, her position in life. And at this point, as, as we're reading through, you might be asking, where, where is her husband in all of this? You know, he does not show up anywhere. He's in, he's in the start, right? Her husband trusts in her, verse 11. And then she is, uh, she's buying fields. She's planting vineyards. She's making clothes. You know, she's wearing nice clothing. And so you might ask, has she gone rogue? Is she just going about her own purposes? Well, now her husband comes back into to focus. You think about the focus has been on her and you kind of get a, a picture now of him. Let's look at his life. Just one verse, just to see what, what he is doing. In verse 23, it says, Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. So now her husband comes into focus and what's in view there is that, that her husband is, you could say, is, is thriving in society. You know, he is at the, the city gates. The gates are the, the place of commerce. This is where trade happened in a city. Uh, this is where uh, the elders, it says, these are the leaders of the, of the city. These where they met. So you have commerce. You have the, the seat of rule and authority at the city gates. Uh, elders being the, the elected, you could say, elected officials of the, the city government. I mean, the same idea as we talk about in the church to have elders uh, overseeing the church. This came from the, the pattern of, of the Israelites where they had elders in the, in the cities, the most faithful men in the city, the most able men in the city who were able to, to oversee the community. He is one of those men. So here is a, a man of good, good standing. He is out in the community. He is working at the city center. And, and you could ask the question as you read this, you know, is there a, a cause and effect here? Is, is he able to thrive because of her work? Is that what's on display? Or maybe the, the opposite. Is she thriving because of her husband, because of his faithfulness? But I, I think it's better just to, just to say that this is here just to show that, that they have each embraced their own role, to say this is good. You know, she is here in the household, taking care of the household affairs, managing all these things so well, and he is over here, out, out in the, the square, in the gate, you know, in the city center, providing, protecting, going after his role. And this, this is a good thing. You know, they are, they are both thriving here, you could say. She has embraced her role. I think that's what's in view in verse 23. She has embraced her role. She is actually supportive of him. This is not a, a bad thing. She is not saying, what about me? Why do I do all this behind the scenes work? I do all the hard labor in the home. And now he gets to be uh, the one recognized with the city officials. He gets to be the one that people see. She's not saying that. Right, this, is, uh, this verse in here is, uh, shows her support for her husband. You know, he has already trusted in her. Uh, verse 11, his heart trusts in her. And now they're in their, their different roles and they have embraced those roles. She is supportive of his role. And we have to be careful here not to equate that the, the measure of godliness of a woman is, is tied to the godliness of her husband. You can think about just biblical examples of ungodly men with godly, ungodly men with godly wives. You think about uh, in 1 Samuel, I think it's 1 Samuel uh, 25, 
you have Nabal in Abigail, Abigail who became the wife of David, and her husband was wicked, right? It says that Abigail was a, a faithful woman, a godly woman, a God-fearer, and Nabal, her husband, is a, a wicked man. He offends King David. He goes after his own purposes. He's about, about to get himself and his whole family killed. If you remember the story, Abigail goes out to meet David. She has planned. She actually gives uh, David and his men all of this food, really a peace offering, and she saves the life of her husband and her whole family. So here is a, a godly woman with a wicked husband. And God, if you remember the story, God actually takes Nabal's life. David doesn't take his life. God actually, actually kills him. But here, I say all that just to say that, that it's possible to pursue faithfulness, whether it's a, a husband like verse 23 or a husband like Nabal, that there is a, a faithfulness on display of a woman who is embracing her role, you know, to be his supporter, to be his helper, to be his strengthener. Even in the, the story of uh, Abigail, she is obviously helping her husband. She is strengthening his hand, whether he uh, recognizes it or not, whether he appreciates it or not. So her support here is in view. And just consider that, that she is doing all of her work not for recognition. He, he is the one that seems to get more public recognition. He is sitting uh, among the elders. He is known at the city gates. People know who he is, and she, she is doing all this behind-the-scenes work. And just consider again, back to Proverbs 31.30, that because she fears the Lord, this is what she is going after. This is uh, back to where we started, just finding her purpose. Her purpose is found in a, a life submitted to the Lord. Say, I want to eagerly serve the Lord, whatever purpose he has for my life. In the, the role that I am, I'm in, the way that he's created me, However he has, uh, has gifted me, I want to serve in that purpose. And it's no different in the, the church at large. As you read uh, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians letters, you see that God gifts the, the church, various members of the church for service, uniquely for service. Uh, different abilities, different divine gifts given. And in 1 Corinthians, you see in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, where, where Paul is is saying to the church, don't say everyone wants to be a hand. I wish I could be that role. I wish I could be that person. He's saying, no, God has specially gifted you for service. You know, the, the goal is, if I'm, if I'm most concerned about the growth of the church, about the glory of Christ in his church, then I'm going to be content serving in whatever place he has put me. Uh, same mindset here for this woman to say she is content serving in whatever, whatever in God's sovereignty he has placed her, wherever he has placed her. She embraces her role. And uh, we, just, we live in a society that, that doesn't agree with this, doesn't understand this. But whether, whether uh, the world around us agrees or not, in the scripture, all the way back in Genesis 2, you see this pattern of a man and a woman you know, becoming one flesh uh, before God making a covenant and God saying that the, the man is the, the leader. The man is the head, Ephesians 5. He is the one who has the authority and responsibility. The wife is a suitable helper to come alongside and strengthen and support him all for this, this work together. So we have to just embrace this truth. Say, we believe this is what God says. We believe that, that purpose, fulfillment is found in going after God's purposes, the way he has created us to be for the sake of his glory. And this is uh, how this woman lives, a supportive wife. And just remember the original audience, Proverbs 31 verse 1 uh, gives us really the background, the introduction to this whole section. The words of King Lemuel the oracle which his mother taught him. So you have a, a mother teaching her son, this is what to look for in a wife. I and mean, that's what Proverbs 31 is. Here's what to look for in a wife. And just for, for young men to put this, in front of, uh, put this in front of our young men, just to say this kind of woman, a woman who is willing to eagerly embrace her role, her station in life, to eagerly be what God made her to be as a suitable helper as you together go after pursuit of Christ. So this is how, how she interacts across the board with, uh, with her husband, with her children, with the, the poor and needy. And then verse 24, we see how she interacts really in the community. We find out that she, she also is in the place of commerce. She actually goes out and she, she trades. Look at verse 24. She makes linen garments and sells them. And she supplies belts to the tradesmen. So this also, this uh, specialty clothing, she has made uh, other specialty clothing. She's made clothing for herself. She's made clothing for her family. 
Now she has excess, so she's actually made clothing and belts that she can trade. There's a, a skill, a resourcefulness that's on display here. Earlier we saw her uh, buy a field, cultivate it, use its proceeds to, to plant a vineyard uh, in verse 16. And now she is taking the, maybe the leftovers of all, all of her work, of the, the wool and the flax, and now she is making more clothes that she can sell. This, this stewardship, this resourcefulness, to go above and beyond. Uh, again, all for the benefit of her household. She's a, she's a net addition to the household. She's not a detractor. The things that she has, she multiplies. So she goes to, to traders. These are the ones who are looking to sell abroad. Uh, this is those that, that want to take goods from, from this place and sell them somewhere else. The, the best of the goods. This is maybe like Etsy before in the, in the Old Testament. Someone that's saying, I'm a marketplace to sell. So you just see, you see her, her ambition, uh, ambition on display, just a, a drive, a productivity. And just to, again, just to zoom out, just to think about the character on display. This is what we're going after. This is a character, godly character produced by one who fears the Lord, who desires to be a, a steward of all the things that they have, who desires to, to work hard, to not be wasteful, to actually expand uh, the resources that God has given for the sake of a kingdom impact. And again, to remind us that, that her priorities were in order. She, she started with the household. Her priority was her home. She went beyond that now to, to sell in the marketplace. And she, she here has everything also planned out, not wasteful. She's not wasted. She's not been frivolous. And, and notice she is selling to, to traders here. There, there's a, a skill involved in this. Uh, this isn't like a lemonade stand. Our, our, our kids did a couple years ago this uh, children's business fair. It was great. They have kids, you make different things, and they have little stands that everyone buys from the kids the, the things that they made. And it's fun, but then you walk away and you spent, you know, 25 bucks on a lot of little trinkets. Uh, but that's not what this is. This isn't like, okay, this is just trinkets. This is merchants. You know, she is actually making fine linen. She is making quality goods. You know, this demonstrates her, again, her work ethic, that she is actually uh, so skilled in her craft. She has worked long hours. She has mastered her craft. And again, just to think about the, the work ethic, going after character, what kind of character would be on display in that? What kind of work ethic? What kind of uh, diligence? You know, what's going to drive her before the Lord to say, I want to work this hard. I don't want to waste my time. I don't, I don't want to waste the, the skills that God has given me. And as, as the, the passage goes on to talk about her clothing, this clothing has been in view. And it moves to, you kind of look at her again. Look up, what is she clothed with? Well, here, verse 25. We saw in verse 22, she, she makes fine linen and purple, but as you look at her, what you see most is not her, her clothes, is not the fine linen. What you see in verse 25 is strength and dignity are her clothing. And she smiles at the future. She is clothed with strength. She is dignified. I think this, this might be my, my favorite verse uh, in this proverb, just this picture of a, of a strong woman, so countercultural. You know, what people would impose on the church, of what the church is... Uh, is hampering women from being strong, from being independent. And here you have a, a strong woman. And look at what her strength is. As you see, her ability to smile at the future. There's a, there's a strength, there's a, a fortitude on display. This is a, a woman of conviction. A similar language to verse 17, that she girds herself with strength. She makes her arms strong. So over and over again here, she is a, a woman of fortitude. She doesn't crack under pressure. Uh, that's going to move us to the, just the next point here, the next realm. As you think about just, again, these pictures of her life. I think about this one just being in regards to the, the burdens that she carries. Uh, all these, not just responsibilities, you just think about just all the burdens. All the burdens of a, of a mom, of a wife. The burdens of children. The burdens of the future. The burdens of all these concerns. All these cares. All these fears. And this is a woman who has all of those things. She has responsibilities. She has children. She has so many things, so many weights to carry. And she doesn't crack under all these pressures. She's not, uh, she's not panicking. She's not uh, worrisome. She's not a, a fretter. She doesn't fret. What you see is uh, just a confidence. 
It says here at the, the end of verse 25, she smiles at the future. Literally, that she laughs at the, the time that is coming. She can look forward with confidence at the future and smile, joyfully stare it in the face. And just think about uh, so often when we think about just hard things that are in front of us. And what's, what the future is, think about just what, what is in the future. It's the, the great unknown. The, the future is filled with uncertainty. It's filled with anxiety. It's filled with fear. We, we don't know what's coming. And she doesn't shy away from it. She doesn't bury her head in the sand and pretend like it doesn't exist. She's not ignoring what's coming. She's not just smiling and pretending everything's okay. And that's the, the temptation for us is to just smile, pretend it's okay, try to ignore it. You know, maybe, maybe go to some, some form of entertainment. I just want to escape, you know, an escapism. I just want to escape from the hard things. I don't want to think about them. I want to get away from them. Well, she doesn't do that. There's not a, an escapism here. She actually stares down an uncertain future, and, she, and she's able to smile upon it. And again, because she fears the Lord, this is a woman who has confidence in the Lord, <clears throat> is able to face an uncertain future without fear. If you were to ask, uh, I think most young women, especially I think about high schoolers, if you asked uh, most high school girls, you know, what, what one of their mo- main struggles is, what, what are the things that you struggle most with in life? And I think the top of that list would be anxiety. You'd probably hear anxiety more than most things. You know, anxiety about what am I going to do with my life, about college, about friends, about school, about relationships, all of these things I'm anxious about. What am I going to do at work? Who am I going to marry? Right? All of these potential concerns, looking at the future and being anxious. And moms, it's no different. You think about mom, the temptation to, to fret over kids, over all the potential dangers, over hard circumstances. So many things to worry about. I, uh, in the, I do the student ministries here, and it seems like every week in the last like, month, there's been a, or last couple months, there's been a new driver, a new kid turning 16. Every time I hear that, I'm like, that's awesome. And then I think about their moms. I'm like, oh, your mom must be terrified. So I feel for, I feel for the moms here with, with 16-year-olds, because you just think about the burdens of a mom as their, as their child drives away for the first time on their own, and the potential for fear, all the uncertainty that comes along with it. And what does this woman do, this woman of virtue? She smiles at the future. She is confident because she fears the Lord. That's where her trust is in. Her trust is not in her circumstances. She's not able to control those. Her her trust is in the Lord. Over and over again, you see this in Scripture. The command, do not fear. Do not fear. Well, the one who fears the Lord is, is able to live a life without fear because they fear God, because they trust him. They trust that he is in control. They trust that he is good and he does good. Uh, I love this phrase just as we're reading through, we've been reading through the book of 1 and 2 Samuel. And over and over again, you see this phrase God referred to as uh, Yahweh of hosts. You know, Lord Sabaoth, the Lord of armies. Think about the the God of all the armies of heaven. You know, this is uh, the one who fears the Lord is saying, I I don't fear because I follow the, the living God who commands the host of heaven. I'm able to, to walk into an uncertain future without fear because that, that is my king, that is my God, that is my father. And think about Psalm 23, just one of the, the best you know, psalms. You think about just being afraid. I tell my kids at night, you know, this is a good one just to read as you're, as you're afraid of the dark. You know, I will not fear. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear for you are with me. You know, to, to pray that, to believe that, that God is with his children, that he cares for them. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So this woman, she has a, a strong faith, a belief in what she can't see. Uh, turn back to, to 1 Peter 3, just for a minute. <clears throat> in that same, that same section where it's talking about just a, a godly woman. And a lot of, you see a lot of parallels in 1 Peter 3 from Proverbs 31, a lot of the same themes on display in, in, verse, in 1 Peter 3, verses uh, 5 through 6, it talks about the, the godly women who walked before, the, the, patri- the matriarchs of the Old Testament. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right 
And then this last phrase, notice this last phrase, without being frightened by any fear. That is what's on display. The, the women who displayed faithfulness. He's saying, look at to these women who were faithful. What was true of them? They walked without fear. I heard a pastor say uh, just this week that the, the biggest obstacle for uh, the submission of a wife to her husband, for a wife to be able to follow her husband, the biggest obstacle is usually fear. Fear, because, because I have to follow this man. All of his weaknesses, poor decision-making, all of the, the failures that I've seen before, all the things that I know he does wrong, I have to follow him. Uh, that, that is where the fear comes in, right? That God has placed this person as a leader in this home. I have to submit under him. He's the one responsible. And you think about the temptation toward fear to control. No, I want to I wanna do it my way. I want to control the circumstance. Well, here, the, the woman who fears the Lord, she is not afraid. She is not controlling because she fears the Lord. This is a, a confidence. This is a, just a picture of godliness. This is what a godly woman looks like. She is strong. She is uh, dignified in the face of adversity, in the face of trial. And she walks without fear. You know, not perfectly. Obviously, we're going to deal with, with fear. There's going to be trials. There's going to be so many things in our life. But what does the, the one who is trusting the Lord do with those fears, with those burdens? You know, 1 Peter 5, we cast those burdens on the Lord. You know, we take those anxieties, those fears, those burdens, and we cast them on the Lord. We say, God, you, you are good. You, you will be good. Your promises are true. You are faithful. That, that is what this woman displays. Uh, just a, a steadfast confidence, taking her burdens to the Lord, you know, casting all of her anxieties on him. And I love this, just a picture also for, uh, for a husband, for husbands in the room to think about. How do you help your wife? What does it look like to encourage her, you know, when she's anxious, to put in front of this, her this picture, to help her, to say, you know, what's going to help a wife who is struggling, a wife who is anxious? What does she need? She needs to understand the, the character of God. She needs to have confidence. She needs to have confidence that he is faithful, that he is powerful. She needs to, to be compelled by the truths of Scripture, that God is who he says he is. He does what he says he will do. So it's so helpful for, again, this picture of a godly woman for all of us to say, yes, this is what we must encourage in each other. This is what we must go after. This is what we must put in front of the, the young women in our homes to say God is, is good and does good. Let, let's trust him again today. So this is how, how she responds, this realm of her life, the, the burdens, all of the, the trials, the concerns, the anxieties, you know, to smile with confidence at the future. And then we see next that when she opens her mouth, kind of moving to her speech, now we get to see when she talks. We haven't seen her speak yet. We haven't seen what comes out of her mouth. Well, now this number, number five, her speech. You know, this realm of faithfulness in her speech. What does she say when she opens her mouth? I think the outline, I should say, I think there's six realms. Last week was three, another three this week. So three plus three, but six realms of faithfulness. Uh, but her speech, she opens her mouth, verse 26, in wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. And just think about wisdom here all, all the way through the book of Proverbs. Wisdom, the, you could say the, the application of truth. Taking uh, truth, the principles of Scripture, what God says, and applying them to the, the situations in life. To be able to take, here, here's this passage, here's this truth, here's this principle. Now how do I apply that to this decision I have in front of me? How do I take all of the things that I know to be true, and how do I respond to what this person says? How do I make a decision about what I should do next? How do I engage in this conversation in a way that would be pleasing to the Lord? And that's when you think about wisdom, that's the goal. How do I please the Lord? He has given me all these tools in his word. He has given me all this truth. Now, how do I use it to walk in a way that's pleasing to him? So wisdom, uh, you could say a skill for living, a skill for, for living in a way that pleases the Lord. So her, her speech is marked by wisdom. What she says demonstrates that she is obviously living this way. She's living a, li a, a wise life, and she's able to speak uh, wisdom. When other people hear her, 
what they hear is truth and not just biblical facts, not just Bible knowledge. This isn't just, she's an encyclopedia. No, but she speaks wisdom. She can actually help them. I hear your situation. I hear your need. And here's God's truth to help you, to encourage you, to strengthen you. And it says the the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. So she speaks wisdom in the the teaching of kindness. And and this word teaching is, is the word Torah, literally the word for God's law or his instruction. You know, pointing the way to what God requires. And kindness, the word for God's loving kindness, this word hesed throughout the Old Testament is the, really the Old Testament word for grace. If you're looking in your Old Testament and saying, where is the word grace that we see everywhere in the New Testament? Well, you actually do find it in the, in the Old Testament, this, this idea of God's loving kindness, his covenant faithfulness. So here, you could, you could take this as a, a more literal, the, the, the teaching, the, the law of loving kindness, the law of God's covenant faithfulness. So she's actually teaching God's law. Or as the, I think the NASB translates it, more of just a, an idea of, of she is teaching uh, kindness. Obviously, uh, through the, the view of God's kindness. I mean, her kindness fueled by the kindness she has experienced from the Lord. But, but either way, her, when she speaks, what comes out is, uh, is kindness. Uh, God's kindness. You know, she is actually motivating others. I love this picture. You think about her speech, just the, the positive nature of teaching God's word in a, in a way that's compelling, to think about moms as motivators to their children. You know, we don't have an audience here for who she's speaking to, but, but you see that in context, I mean, obviously verse 28, her children are in view, her husband's in view, the household. You know, think about a mom being the, the one who is teaching kindness, who is motivating others toward godliness. She's putting in front of them, here's what God says. Here's what he requires Here's what I want you to go after because I love this God. I want you to love him too. You know, she, she is not coming with a, with a hammer. Obviously, we have a, there's a, a rod of reproof. There is discipline needed. But in that, she is pointing them to a, a loving God who forgives. You know, I think about, again, fear, fear of the Lord, both, both sides of the, the equation here, to say a, a fear of offending a holy God. And for the one who, who has been reconciled to that God, a desire to please him. That's what it means to fear God. And for us who have been united in Christ through the gospel, you know, we have seen God as a judge, as a just judge. And we have seen Christ as a, as a savior who has forgiven us through his blood. And now we are reconciled to that judge. So as we point others, we point our children to this God. As they look at the, this God who is just, you need to understand you need to believe his law. Your, your, your conscience needs to be convinced that this is God's word, to not disregard it, to obey it, because it's, it's from God, it's his word. And at the same time, you need to know that this God forgives, that he reconciles sinners into his family. And that's what she is teaching. She is pointing them to, to wise living, living that pleases the Lord, teaching kindness to them, pointing them in a, in a direction of godliness, uh, taking them by the hand, you could say, and saying, let, let me help you follow this God. Let me help you see his goodness in the pages of Scripture. And just consider here in verse, verse uh, 25 and 26, for her to have confidence in the future and for her to speak wisdom, she obviously has to know the Scripture. She has to know truth. I mean, she's confident in God's character because she, she knows what the, the Scripture says about him. She's able to speak truth to others. She's able to speak wisdom because she knows the scriptures. She has traveled these truths in her own heart. You know, they have impacted her first. So she is discipling others because she has first uh, experienced God and she has uh, experienced him in his word. And I, I love this uh, quote that came across just uh, about a, a mother teaching her kids, uh, young kids, thinking them about just the, teaching them the kindness of the Lord, this phrase, teaching of kindness. And in this, uh, in this parenting book, it says uh, this quote from a mother to, to another mother. She writes, one of the most delightful offices of a mother is that of leading the minds of her little children up to God as a father. Early, they should be taught that he takes care of them every day and keeps them safely every night. And that he knows when they are sick and pities them, that it is he that cures them and gives them parents to love and watch over them, 
They should be taught short prayers, such as they will perfectly understand. They should be encouraged and offer some of them themselves morning and evening. And often at these times, the heart of the devout mother will be gladdened by the intelligent inquiries of the little children about the great God. I just love that, that picture of, of a mom just teaching, teaching kindness, teaching God's faithfulness to her children. They are the, you could say, the, the primary beneficiary, beneficiaries of her love and of her affection. And that's going to bring us to the last point. The, the ones who receive this first, her, her priority is, is her home, this last realm that we see. The last realm we see here in the, in the 20, verse 27 through 29 and verse 30 and 31 are really a, a summary of her life, but 27 through 29, her home. This is where her faithfulness is displayed. Uh, the, the first priority we talked about, her household. Uh, not a new theme here in this, in this passage. She has already uh, provided food and clothing for her household, verse 15. She has provided uh, clothing, verse 21, for the snow. She's prepared them. And now verse 27, uh, really a, a big picture summary. This is what she does for her household. Verse 27, she looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. She, she looks well. You could say she acts as a, as a watchman. She looks, looks after the needs of her household. She is on the alert. She is uh, assessing what her household needs. She's on the lookout for dangers. Uh, you could say she knows the, the climate of her home. Or she has a, a finger on the pulse of her home. And we saw that she was already prepared for the winter. She already knew what they needed practically. So she's, she's already uh, taking this responsibility. She's already been running with this. And just to, just to consider, think about Ephesians 6.4 that says the fathers do not provoke your children, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Uh, fathers with the, you could say, the, the primary responsibility. You know, the buck stops with the father. But then you also see, even in this passage, that the, the husband, the father, is, is out in the community. You know, she is home more than he is. If he is uh, providing and protecting, if he's out there, and her time revolves more in the, in the household, and he's the one responsible, well, think about just the, the picture of a helper helping her husband you know, strengthening him for the sake of parenting. You know, she has her finger on the pulse. How are the kids doing? She knows. She is helping him in that regard. She knows the issues, the concerns, the weaknesses. Here are the, the challenges going on in the home. Here are the ways I can help strengthen your hand as, as I try to support parenting together, as I come alongside of you. So that's the, the picture here is that she is, she is the, the watchman. She looks well over the ways of her household. She has uh, embraced this, this role in the house. Think about Titus 2, a familiar passage. Titus 2, 4, and 5. You just listen uh, to what it says, Paul here, to the, the church. Really, this instruction to older women, the pattern of the church. Older women, he says, to teach the younger women so that they may encourage the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, to be pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. And I think that, you know, this idea of workers at home, really a parallel to Proverbs thirty-one twenty-seven, that she takes care of the, the way, she looks after the way of her household, that her, she has a, a focus, a priority on making sure that her, her household is in order, that she has thought through all of the issues, that she has, a, again, a pulse on the household, uh, contrast that to, to the adulterous woman, Proverbs 7.11. You have this scene of this adulterous woman, uh, the man that goes by her house. And just this really shocking statement about this woman, this adulterous woman, Proverbs 7.11, it says, she is boisterous and rebellious and her feet do not remain at home. That is the, the contrast, the one who is rebellious, who is boisterous, who has actually neglected her household responsibility. There's rebellion in her heart. And it's seen as, as just neglecting, running away from this responsibility. So here we have uh, this woman. You see her selling and trading. She's in the marketplace. She's doing all these other things. But again, her priority, her focus is on the household. She has not abandoned this, this primary responsibility. She looks after the ways of her household. 
And, uh, and we'll close here just this last statement, Proverbs 27. Uh, it says, she does not eat the bread of idleness. She does not eat the bread of idleness. Uh, you know, the, you could say one of the greatest detractors here in view of her being able to, to go about this work would be laziness, uh, idleness. To eat the bread of idleness is to, to enjoy it, to, to enjoy idleness, you know, to consume it, to, to, to be self-indulgent, to say, I, I want to be idle and it feels good. You think about the, the sluggard, Proverbs 10. The sluggard says, a, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands. You know, just a little bit. I just want a little bit and then a little bit more. And here, she has trained her heart to, to not enjoy that. She has trained her heart to not eat that bread, to not, to not say, I, w- I want to enjoy that. It, it feels good to go after comfort and ease. You know, she has trained herself to run away from those things so that she can she can go after her household, so that she can uh, embrace, again, embrace the responsibilities the Lord has given, that God has given her a stewardship uh, as, a, as a child of the king, to be a steward of all the resources that God has put in your life, whether that's married, not married, kids, not kids. Just think about yourself as a steward of the king. A god fear is one who takes those responsibilities, uh, embraces those responsibilities, is eager to take those responsibilities. And I had uh, just uh, one brother come up to me last week and said afterward, he said, hey, you, you got to go into the, the men more. They need, to hear, they need to hear a little more exhortation and, uh, in this passage. And I think just, just to, to kind of zoom out for the, the men, especially the married men, just to, to hear a passage like this, uh, and even the young men that, that would like to be married, you know, to say, I, I have to be further ahead. I have to be a, a harder worker. I need to be able to lead my wife in these things. I mean, all of these virtues, they, they really up the stakes for the man to be able to say, I want to I wanna help my wife get here. Well, that assumes that, that you're doing well in these things. That assumes that you're being faithful. So this isn't a, an opportunity just to point our finger and say, hey, you need to work on this. But for all of us to say, man, I, I need to, if I'm a man, I need to lead in these things. I need to go after these things so I can help my wife, so I can encourage and support her in these so let me, uh, let me close our time. We'll finish, like I said, next week. Finish working through the passage and then just, just kind of take a look at what are the kind of the characteristics we're going to summarize on display in this woman's life. So let me, uh, let me pray and then you'll be dismissed. God, thank you uh, just for this picture of, of godliness, of biblical femininity, of a woman who fears you, uh, a woman who is walking in a way that pleases you. I, I pray that the, the women in this room, that you would just uh, encourage them, motivate them, give them strength through your spirit this week to go after these things, not as a, a burden, but as a delight to be uh, in your family, in your service, to be saved by Christ, to be freed from a love of self so that we can eagerly embrace what you have for us. So I pray that we would believe these truths, believe that this is actually a path toward fulfillment in this life and really a life that is pleasing to you. So I pray that we would be a a church that is marked by an overwhelming desire to please you uh, because we love you, Jesus. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.